everyone. I hope you're doing well. I have a special guest with me today, Carolyn Bowler, who is the CEO of BTC Markets, a crypto exchange located in Australia. Carolyn, it's great to have you. Thank you so much for having me. Let's start with your background. Where are you from? What did you do before crypto? And how did you first discover cryptocurrencies? Sure. So I am originally from Ireland and I spent my career pre-crypto BC uh, working in financial services. I worked first for a private client stockbroker in Dublin uh, back in the days uh, of paper-based stock certificates. And so one of my first projects was dematerialization of uh, stock certificates. And in a sense, I've been doing that ever since. Um, so I worked as a private client broker and then moved into uh, working with a US investment bank in Dublin and transferred with them to Singapore in 2008. Mm. So spent the GFC hunkered down in, in, in Asia. Um, but my background then was working in operations, so financial services operations. So I understand the workings of the settlement cycle and, and, and cash management and all of those kind of fun, sexy parts of the financial yeah. services system that doesn't always get the full attention. And then moved into an area called prime brokerage where all my client base uh, were hedge funds dotted around the world. But I was servicing them as part of a team based in, in Singapore. So Singapore in Hong Kong, Australia. Um, I left the banking world uh, to go back to university and I did another degree in Singapore um, in communications and left and set up the first fintech blockchain focused PR communications agency in Asia Pacific. Wow. And that was in about, I think, 2015, if memory serves me right, the creaking memory. Mm -hmm. um, and that was such an exciting time um, to be a part of it because it was all just starting to come through. But it, it was that time I'd spent in operations that really gave me the foresight to see, well, goodness, what's coming with this technology is just going to be so transformational. Um, and that was just from, from my own little sector, my own little experience. So for me, it was, it was just such, such a no-brainer. I'm so mm -hmm. pleased I managed to get in at the ground level, if you like. Um, so I worked in my own agency, the client space, both in Singapore, throughout Asia Pacific and then worldwide, uh, which is brilliant to kind of be at the cutting edge of technology, through, you know, through these clients. And one of them was BTC Markets, mm. as it turns out here in Australia. Um, I eventually sold my business and moved permanently to here to Melbourne. Um, and then earlier on this year, an opportunity came up to join BTC Markets as their CEO. And I absolutely jumped at the chance to, to join such a fantastic team. That's awesome. And it's interesting because we're seeing uh, more folks similar to your background where you have a background in finance, traditional finance, and now coming into the more decentralized area of finance of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. Uh, very cool. So can you give us an overview of BTC Markets Services? Obviously a crypto exchange, but we'd love to uh, deep dive into the services you provide, maybe the crypt some of the top cryptos you have, fiat pairs, what markets you service, and so forth. Sure. So we've been around since 2013. So we're one of the oldest exchanges in, in Australia. Um, and it's an all Australian team, uh, Australian technology kind of being used. Um, we've got about 27 trading pairs. Aussie dollar is our fiat and then BTC. So relatively straightforward in that sense. Um, we've got uh, our main, I suppose, coins would be BTC, Ethereum, XRP, and Litecoin. Um, and that's where we we'll probably see the most amount of interest, but we do list others and we list other tokens that are kind of specific to Australia, such as Power Ledger. So there's a few different, we've got a good flavor of, of, of different coins on the exchange, but we have about, I think, 260,000 verified Australian account holders. So there is interest here in the local market, but as well as it from a retail point of view, we also have um, the self-managed super fund or SMSFs, mm. which are a very significant part of, of the overall financial market here in Australia. So we have a number of those um, that we look after too. And, and they've got a different flavor. Their timelines are different um, than the retail spot in and out kind of trading passions that you would that you'd usually see. All that, you know. So it's really interesting um, and tremendous growth opportunity here. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I was curious to find out from you, you know, how are the crypto regulations in Australia? Because here in the United States, we are waiting for actual clear regulations from the government um, still in the works. Cryptocurrencies, of course, you can buy, sell, trade them here in the United States. But what's it like on the, on the Australian side? How are things progressing there? Are you seeing uh, things progressing in the direction of being crypto friendly? Are there still challenges, things along those lines? 
Well, here's what I think. Uh, I mean, well, the, to paint the picture right now, uh, me, well, my company is a crypto exchange. We are regulated by an entity called Oztrack, and they look after our AML, KYC, kind of CTF um, compliance. We comply with all of those regulations. Um, and the tokens themselves or coins themselves, Bitcoin or coins similar to Bitcoin, I think is the phrasing, are considered um, an asset similar to property for the purposes of tax reporting. And I know that the Australian Tax Office is very um, up to date or tries to keep up to date with all that's happening within the market. But I think with regulation, both in Australia and worldwide, it's always by the very nature going to be on the chase. Mm. Um, it's never going to be up to, because how could it possibly be? Sure. Um, I think Australia and other markets are, 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 are going forward with the, you know, to try and cover what's coming through. Um, but I'm really excited about the changes that I've seen in regulation and just general attitude changes since, as I say, I started back in 2014, 2015, and where we are now. Um, there's still a huge amount needed in terms of education and, and just comfort levels. But even just looking at what's been put forward, kind of, I know the, the US have based some of theirs on the Swiss point of view of, of that bucket, that crypto security, crypto utility token, and kind of Swiss crypto bond in some sense, that they're coming out with. And I, I'm really heartened by that. But you're looking at, I think in the US House of Congress, there's 30 odd pieces of yeah. legislation up for discussion, looking at what's happening in Europe, the ESMA similarly, are they looking to put together a framework um, for all member states dealing with, um, with crypto and blockchain chain associated um, financial products. That is fantastic. And I think that it's only going to grow, it's only going to improve. I, I remember the start of the internet back in the day, and I can remember um, when I was in university in the mid to late 90s, and we managed to sneak into the postgraduate computer laboratories. Now I was doing, an, I was an art student, but my friends were all doing applied maths and computer science. So they stuck me in. And sitting there looking at uh, the postgraduate students, so they're the creme de la creme, and they have on their laptops, or sorry, on their desktop computers, um, cameras. And they were talking to each other from one end of the room to the other. And at the time, my mind was blown because sure. I just thought, this is such amazing technology. How will we ever be at better this? Mm -hmm. And now it's so commonplace, you carry it around in your pocket. Right. And so if I can come up with the same analogy, then when I look at what's happening with blockchain and with digital assets, for me, it's just a question of time. And it's just a question of everybody catching up with that. Because then obviously they had to regulate you know, the internet practices and you know, how do you toss it with those questions? And I think that blockchain and digital assets kind of put forward those same questions to our regulators. As you can tell, I'm extremely passionate about the subject. <laughs> and we'll quite mm -hmm. happily talk over hours about it. But um, but it's just so exciting for me and I'm just absolutely enthralled by it all. Yeah, I, I love your thoughts around that and, and I often make the analogy too of the internet, the dot com era where you know we went through a phase without regulations and then regulations came and the technology advanced and folks innovated so uh and and to your point it, around the globe the governments are still catching up people are still learning and eventually mm -hmm. we'll but, but to your point when we started around 2014 when you started i should say uh things have progressed very well since then yeah absolutely yeah. and i think it's just about um you know there's other uh I suppose legislative bodies or, or kind of governments around the world that are that are uh perhaps early adopters and looking at this technology and i can only say that because i was in singapore for such a long time and could see where the singapore government were going with it and how they were kind of making um inroads into the community and just making those touch points and trying to get across it um but everyone you know they're all kind of going at their own pace on it and i wouldn't want to compare one response to another but but I think ultimately it's just the destination that we're all heading to. And it's just a question of when. Um, so yeah, very, very exciting. Yeah, great point. Um, so I want to talk a bit about Ripple ODL. Uh, BTC Markets is a Ripple ODL partner on demand liquidity. Um, I'm curious, how did that partnership come about? You know, where you guys were selected, uh, maybe Ripple approached you or you approached Ripple. Any insight you can give there? And I understand there may be not, uh, things you cannot disclose, so we certainly understand that. That would probably yeah. be one of the things I cannot disclose, <laughs> only because I, it's, I kind of don't want to uh, talk about somebody else behind their back, <laughs> if you sure. like, and the approach is the kind of commercial sensitivities around that. But I am very happy to talk about uh, and again, for me, my personal opinion around ODL and what's going on. Sure. And it, for me, it goes back to that time working in the investment bank and working in operations there. And as I was starting out, 
it used to be a T plus three trade settlement cycle. Mm. And that at the time was cutting edge. And the thought of going to T plus one was beyond, it was just so exciting. Mm. Um, and I, you know, and I did get very excited about it because I'm such a nerd for this stuff. And so now I'm on an exchange where we settle trades in seconds, and and that ease and it doesn't fall over. It works. It's fantastic, and and it's inexpensive and it's accessible to everybody. And you get all of that fantastic freedom that comes with knowing you've got that secure method of transfer. For me, it's it's really exciting. But again, coming from my background of looking at having to literally kind of stuff envelopes with certificates and things and then give them to a courier to get them across to a stock exchange and settle. Like coming from that to something that can be done so quickly, mind is blown, I absolutely love it. So that's my personal opinion around around ODL and around uh, Ripple and XRP. And that's true, I suppose, for all of the different blockchain um, solutions that are coming out specific to the financial services industry um but for us just to kind of go back to that we look after the australian dollar to the filipino peso that's mm. that's our initial channel that we look after and um as i understand it i mean it's a sizable market i think it's about us 1.8 billion we sent back in personal remittances between the two countries in 2018 so there's there's a chunky piece there mm -hmm. um but it's only the start of the journey i think i think for, for ripple and for for where xrp is going to go yeah, I think uh, some folks have been tracking the volume um, with you guys and with Bitso and Co uh, Coins.ph and so forth. And we're seeing the volume increase. It looks like there's adoption. People are leveraging the Ripple ODL connection via your, uh, your exchange and so forth. Um, without naming names, um, I'm sure you can't do that, but are you? what type of clients or, or institutions are leveraging ODL? Could you say banks, payment providers? And okay, if you cannot. Well, sorry, you just broke up a little there, but but for for our side, what we're seeing with with ODL, well, just to give you, I suppose, context, mm -hmm. I think we're averaging about a five percent week on week growth since January in terms of volume coming through our exchange on XRP, um, and that's a combination of both, I suppose, the ODL traffic and and interested people in in XRP, um, and then April was probably our biggest month, and it's kind of averaging out now, I think, about an eighty four percent growth since January. So there's a lot out there that are interested in in trading xrp through our platform um but in terms of where we sit in the odl kind of uh, timeline for us we're the utility partner we don't necessarily see who or what is doing the transaction on the other side we've got a limited number of people that we that we can that are connected to us that put that through our, our platform um and our visibility thereafter is is, is relatively limited um, and, and from our point of view, we're just su super excited to be, you know, a live use case of blockchain technology in the financial services system here in Australia. And I think anybody who's involved in this industry has to have that that kind of almost childlike excitement at being part of something so new and transformational and so impactful. I, I know that there that, that say for example in the Philippines, um, international remittances coming home is about ten percent of their GDP. G. I mean that is a sizable chunk of an economy yeah. that's coming back in personal remittances. And if you can suddenly open that up into a safe and inexpensive, speedy way. Um, to send the money back home to your family, who wouldn't want to be a part of that? Just, you know, on a, on a human level. And it's something anyway that, that for me, anyway, I take it incredibly seriously as part of my job, both just looking after XRP and, and, and so on, but all of our client accounts, I consider them to be, you know, that, that somebody's dreams are in there. You know, you know yeah, I know that sounds yeah. quite romantic almost, but, but I do believe in that because I think about it from my own point of view, my own personal point of view, my hopes and aspirations, you know, that need kind of backing either through kind of financial resources and so on. And that's how I look at, look at my bank accounts and yeah. my trading accounts. And so I take that and that's something, you know, that is, across our team, we take it very, very seriously. And I think in some respects here in Australia, we've got something of a conservative reputation and, and, and duly so. We've always been kind of um, the sleeping giant, if you like. We've always been relatively quiet about our position mm -hmm. here in Australia. Um, but if anything, that conservative ethos is because we take it so seriously about looking after our clients and looking after their hopes and aspirations. So I know we kind of started one point in the conversation, but now we're here because 
say that the passion for the subject kind of comes through. <laughs> no, absolutely. I, I think uh, with the technology comes the impact and how that's helping people, right? Um, because if there wasn't a demand, if it wasn't bringing a solution um, to a problem, I, I don't think it would it, it be beneficial or it wouldn't grow. It wouldn't be, have lasting potential. So it sounds like um, there's is growth there and folks are leveraging Ripple ODL. Obviously, you guys don't have insight into who, but on the back end, you are seeing the transactions come through um, and the volume growing, it sounds like. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I know kind of looking at the price point just from our exchange, we've seen a 15% uh, increase, I think, since the start of the year. So that volume does have an impact on price um, in, in, in a positive relationship. Um, but again, I mean, that's that's a snapshot of a few months. I couldn't possibly point to a trend overall and, you know, come back to me at the end of the year and we'll see where trading numbers are then or even just, you know, over the three to five year timeline. Um, but it's certainly from my point of view, I, I think it's a very exciting use of blockchain technology and um, safety is that we get to be a part of it. Very cool. Um, I'm going to ask a question. I don't know if you can answer it and that's okay if you can't. Is there plans to, and you don't have to name the corridors or anything, but plans to maybe add other corridors in the future down the road? Well, I think it's probably a discussion to have with the team at Ripple to Got see it. what their plans are as well. Um, but I know from our point of view, we're so excited about being a part of it. And, you know, if we could be so fortunate as to be part of more, then we'd be delighted. Um, just because, as I say, that, that kind of sense of, of being a part of something bigger than ourselves, who doesn't want to go to work every day and have that feeling? It's fantastic. So, yeah, so hopefully we'll see, we'll see what comes of it. Okay, very cool. Um, I wanted to get your thoughts around Bitcoin. Um, we just had the third halving. Um, its value and it, utility has been on the rise. And, um, you know, it, it's also global. And, and I'm curious, you know, the perspective of folks in Australia. What do they think about Bitcoin? And how is Bitcoin, uh, maybe is it seeping into the mainstream there? Because it's starting to happen here on TV shows and a lot of different uh, Wall Streeters are getting in. So I'm curious about what's taking place there and how Bitcoin's positioned given the having and, you know, it's lead, it leads the market for the most part. Yeah, it does. Oh, absolutely. Uh, from, I'm trying to remember the source of the survey, and I want to say it's the Royal, uh, the Royal Bank of Australia, oh, sorry, the Reserve Bank of Australia, um, who put out a survey that said I think 80% of Australians have heard of Bitcoin. So 80% have heard, but according to the ATO, I think only about 1 million Australians hold uh Bitcoin. So, mm -hmm. so you've got eighty percent awareness, but only four percent trading. Um, and those are relatively recent figures taken in the last in the last year or two. So that will give you a sense of the growth that's out there. Um, but I do think that we're increasingly seeing, and more than anywhere, as it seeps through popular culture, become increasingly cognizant of, of what Bitcoin is about. Um, I think with quantitative easing, it's a fantastic counterpoint yeah. to that kind of deflationary asset. I think that's a narrative that people are really getting their heads around now and starting to see and understand it for something more than perhaps a flash in the pan. Um, but I think that it's it's going to be, obviously it's the industry leader and it's going to continue that figurehead position for the, for the foreseeable future. But there's an awful lot more coming through that use blockchain technology. And I think that perhaps as we build out the ecosystem around it, um, we'll see more and more engagement here in Australia. Very cool. Um, I don't know how much you know on this front, but curious to get your thoughts around Ethereum going to maybe a uh, uh, proof of stake with Vitalik mm -hmm. saying, yeah, it's going to happen this year, Ethereum 2.0. Any thoughts around that? And, and it's okay if you haven't maybe dived into the issue. Well, no, I have to have taken a look. I think like anybody who's the head of an exchange, you're kind of always reading as much as you can about what's coming. And goodness me, there's no end of stuff. Uh, that's so exciting. Um, as far as I know, it's going 2.0 in July from, from the latest piece that I read about it. But from our point of view, equally, I haven't seen a finalized version of the structure that they're going to take with it. Uh, I know it's going proof of stake because uh, that, that's common knowledge. Um, and for me, conceptually, I'm really excited about that. I think that that's, it's great to have a counterpoint again, if you like, to, to Bitcoin and, and to proof of work and so on, but particularly something of that size and significance to the, to the market. Um, so yeah, we're kind of with basic breath. We can't wait. We've had a halving and now we're going to get a 2.0. This is fantastic to see some a rapid um, pace of change. For sure. Um, next question I have here, 
where, where do you see the crypto market in maybe two to three years? And I think just given your background coming from traditional finance, and I'm not talking about price predictions, but adoption and growth. Mm-hmm. I know we just highlighted mainstream exposure, but where, where do you see the market overall in two to three years? Well, goodness. Okay, so as I say, started getting involved in about 2014, 2015, and look at where we are now. Um, so in two to three years, uh, it, it's absolutely on a trajectory of growth. I, I can't be dissuaded from that point. Um, and that's simply because of how human trends tend to go. It's not necessarily because of my own position as the CEO of, of an exchange. But once you start bringing in um, legislation, once you start mainstreaming it in that way, once you start building out the infrastructure that makes it possible for larger institutional players to come in and get involved, it's a whole other ball game then. And even just to put it in context here, so from, from our point of view, um, the Australian super funds, which are the pension funds, if you like, the private pension funds of Australia, the size of that pension fund industry alone, just in Australia, is six and a half times the global cap of all crypto. Wow. So it's very, very difficult for them to get an on and off ramp into an industry, into an asset class such as, as crypto digital assets. So if that's just Australia. Can you imagine for the rest of the world? Um, it's so until we get that kind of considerable mass size, until we get that regulatory oversight that we need, until we get the infrastructure built out that these that these bodies need to get involved. Um, but that's something I think we'll see increasingly two, three, and five year timeline. Um, I mean, in ten years time, it's I, I would assume and predict based on that trajectory that it's just going to become just a normal part of an uh, an investor's portfolio um, alongside other asset classes, alongside gold and. and, and equity and for me personally i don't see it in competition per se and that i don't think it's a binary yes or no i think it's going to be a a part of a blended portfolio for in in 10 years time 15 25 years time i couldn't possibly say (laughs) but but that's how i would see it going absolutely and and as i say that's not just because of my role now but in a sense that like I, I seeing the growth that this industry has gone through in mm. such a short pace of time, my goodness, I, you know, I wouldn't dare put a, a limit to its march. Yeah, absolutely. I, I feel it is moving faster than even the dot com era because, you know, we, we didn't, it was the, f- the dawn of the internet and you had dial up internet, right? And, and oh, yeah. now we're building on top of internet, but everything is faster. The technology is more advanced. So. Um, yeah, so, yeah. So I think that people's expectations of it are faster. Sure. That, that we are increasingly living in such a, a technology-based age. It's certainly in, in developed societies increasingly to, you know, developing. Um, so our expectations are at speed. Because even if you look at the expectation, I mean, realistically, Bitcoin's been around for about a decade mm-hmm. and crypto has been around for about a decade. And yet people's expectations are that we can compete with an industry that's been around for centuries and has that much time to build it out. So it's been an unrealistic expectation, but that's that's just where we are now, I think, as, as a society. Sure. Uh, final question here. You know, what else could we expect from BTC markets in 2020? Any hints you can drop? Uh, maybe new cryptos getting added? Anything you can shine a light on? So part of my job to come in is to push us into a new era. Um, I think that the team that have built BTC markets have done a fantastic job um, and they've created something that's stable, that is secure, that is reliable and that's great for all of our users. But that to me was very, you know, part of the phase one of, of crypto and digital assets more generally. I'm coming in with my investment banking background to look at it through those eyes and to see how can we push this forward um, and in what areas can we do so. But equally, equally, I worked for hedge funds during the global financial crisis. So that equally has shaped my perspective in terms of risk and in terms of um, good practices, best practices. So so I've kind of got that blend of experience and also excitement. Um, and so I think we can expect to see good things coming out of BCC markets, not just in 2020, but also beyond um, and, and in the kind of the short term as it rolls out past that. I don't say any more than that, but I will definitely let you know <laughs> when, <laughs> when we come through. But it's, it's I, 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 you know, how can, how can you not be in this industry and be excited to bring in new change? You, know, you shouldn't be in this job if you're not. Yeah, absolutely. And I would love to have you back on as, you know, updates uh, unfold on your end. 
Um, and, you know, we can talk about it at that point, of course. So thank you so much for joining us today and, and all the information you shared. Thank you.